Well, good morning. And welcome this morning. I want you to know that this was totally unplanned. The, the verse on the front of the cover of the bulletin is Matthew 5.14a, year of the light of the world. And the scripture reading is Matthew 5.14 through 16. I picked the scripture reading um, and then when I went to print them this morning, I pulled out the bulletins and it was just a happy little coincidence. So I did not do that on purpose, whether that was good or whether that's, that's stupid to have the same verse on the cover and on the inside. It was not on purpose. It was a happy little accident. So we can make those into birds, I guess. Bob Ross. Uh, as far as upcoming events, we do have our men's prayer time at 5 o'clock today. We have a snack scheduled for next Sunday night. Um, we don't have a theme or anything like that, but oh, Abby has a theme. A picnic. She doesn't even like sandwiches. Oh, a cookout. Oh, okay. What? Ooh. Ooh, if we got corn, picked it, and we could even do roasted corn. There's still enough corn in the garden for that, I think. We'll also be able to decorate with fall for fall with corn stalks without having to go somewhere to pick them up. Some of those are nice tall corn stalks out there too. Okay, so we'll have a picnic and with the chairs we'll be able to like put tables up. Wait, this side is more populated. What? Or go outside. Depending on the weather. Void where prohibited by law, not available in all areas something we could do that we do have a few picnic tables and other tables we can easily remove to put outside okay so now we've got a theme it might be a small picnic unless people here online and say hey i need now need to get myself to niob church next sunday night and go to the picnic This takes a while to make hamburgers. They can't be pre-cooked. That would be bad. They have to be made like Sunday night. Uh, as far as prayer items on our prayer list, uh, in-service days start this week for uh, the end of this week for Chautauqua Christian Academy and students report next week. So be in prayer for Chautauqua Christian Academy as they start up a new school year uh, with somewhere in the neighborhood of 160 students. Jen's dad is scheduled for a wrist surgery this Wednesday, um, but had, but Jen's mom had uh, kidney stones this week and landed in the ER and is on antibiotics and painkillers. Uh, so we are praying that everything is able to move forward and uh, uh, for both of their health at present. Uh, remember the Aldrich family with a funeral today? The Madrid family, as they are spending a month out in the Midwest, um, I think it has to do with Mrs. Madrid's mold allergy and trying to get her somewhere where it's a dry heat. So um, I do not know all the details, like, but I, I can imagine that unless they've got some special circumstances, being able to afford moving for a month. Uh, is not that easy. So pray for God's provision for them and the medical needs and and all of that. Uh, I think they've still got kids in school, right? That they homeschool? Yeah. So homeschooling on the road and juggling all of those things. So pray for the Madrid family. That's the uh, son-in-law and daughter of, of the uh, camp director down at Servants Heart Camp. Um, continue to pray for uh, that family's needs. Uh, remember the McChesneys in prayer and uh, the McChesney Stewart family. Um, but that's the, uh, I think, the update on many of those things. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we start off this morning. Father, we are so thankful for answers to prayer. Uh, we're thankful for the uh, blessings that you give us each and every day, and, and so often we take them for granted. The, the strength uh, to get up in the morning and, and uh, food on our tables and, and clothes in our closets and uh, transportation to be able to get where we need to go and where we want to go and uh, we've certainly been blessed and 
you've blessed this church here with a, a building and, and uh, with meeting our needs here, and we're grateful for that. We do pray for these requests as we've mentioned them. We think of the Madrid family and pray for their needs. Uh, we think of the McChesney family and Stewart family and, and, and for their needs as well. Uh, Father, pray for your blessing there. We pray for Chautauqua Christian Academy as they prepare to start another school year, that you would be at work and, and meeting the needs that are there and help them to be able to minister into the hearts and lives of students and families. And uh, Father, just pray for your blessing. And we pray for Jen's parents and, and uh, with the wrist surgery this week and with Jen's mom dealing with the kidney stone, uh, we pray that you would bring healing to her and strength to her as well. We do pray as we look into your word this morning and as we sing songs of praise, uh, Lord, that our, our hearts would be in it, that we would lift our hearts in song to you. And, and uh, as we look into your word, that we would respond in a way that honors and glorifies your name. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together. To revive us again. 295 in the hymnal. 295. Revive us again. <clears throat> We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Spirit of life, who has shown us a Savior and scattered our right. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. May be seated. Let's go to 470. Footsteps of Jesus, 470. Oh. 
of Jesus, wherever they go. And to 379, take my life and let it be. 379. Let's stand as we read our, do our scripture reading. And we'll do our reference at the beginning and at the end. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew five fourteen through 16. Thank you. you. May be seated. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we take up our offering this morning. Father, we are grateful that we can sing your praise. We're grateful that we can lift our, our voices in song. Lord, even as we sang a song of consecration, to take our lives and let them be. Some areas of that are easier than others. Take my voice as I sing your praise. That's easy, but take my voice that everything that comes out of my mouth honor and glorify you gets a lot harder. Take my silver and my gold as I place it in the offering plate. It seems to be an easier thing than uh, taking control of my finances and Lord, I pray that we would be consecrated to you, that we would seek to honor and glorify and praise you and lift you up, uh, that men might see our good works and glorify you. We do pray as we take up our offering this morning that we would honor you uh, with our, our, our gifts, but also with our hearts as we give, that we would uh, give out of hearts of praise and of thanksgiving for what you've done for us. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
redeem that offertory. My sins are gone. The, uh, the uh, message title this morning, The Value of a Good Testimony. Well, you can think of testimony in a, in a couple different ways. Uh, one church I attended when I was in college, South Clinton Baptist Church in Waymart, Pennsylvania. Uh, small church, about the size of, of, of this building, not, not that big of a, a church building. Uh, there was a, a family in it. They had three kids and all of the kids that their kids could bring home from college, which they seemed... I don't know how all of us ended up going there, but there was about eight of us from the college that would end up going there. And every Sunday, the the mother of the kids that came to Baptist Bible College and drug home all their friends for the weekend or for Sunday would make dinner for all of us college kids. I think that was part of the draw to the church was we'll get more college kids out here. And every Sunday, uh, this, this uh, woman... And this family, there were three kids and two adults would feed, I think there was normally 11 or 12 of us for dinner. And that was just their, their normal way of, of serving God and serving the church. But as we were in that church, every Sunday evening, the pastor would ask if anyone had a testimony to share. And a certain man got up almost without fail every time a testimony was asked for. And he would say, 50 years ago, I was an unsaved man and he got into what he was into and the Lord pulled me out of that and I was saved. Now that's that's a testimony, right? Where God found us and what God changed us into. But there's another aspect of the testimony as well. And uh, the my sins are gone plays with both areas of that testimony. That, that testimony of I was a sinner and now I've saved by grace. That God has made a change in my life and I'm not the same thing I was, the same person I was when God found me. Now there's aspects of that same person. There's still struggles with sin with that same person. So there's that testimony of what God's done in my life. And the other side of that testimony is what the world sees when they see us. Our testimony before the world. And it's related because our testimony is the fact that while we were sinners, we've been saved by grace and there's a new life that's on display. And the power, the value of a godly testimony. Because if I said, a, I think I probably said a good testimony online. should be a godly testimony. Because um, some people are like, well, if I had a good testimony, I would have been involved in a gang. You know, and I would have been, uh, Chip Ingram in our Sunday school lesson this morning was sharing about a guy on death row that's uh, cleaned up his act and trying to live for God, even though he's on death row. Uh, that's life imprisonment. He is seeking to live for God where God has him. And uh, he said he requested a move because in the yard he was, he couldn't find any real believers. Now in prison, you can, find, you can find some fake believers because being a Christian and going to the services looks good when it comes time for parole. So there are lots of Christians in jail that may not be Christians from the heart. He said, I can't find anyone that's a Christian from the heart. That, and he asked to be moved. And th that doesn't happen. But the warden looked at his situation and said, well, this, this guy's not who he used to be. I guess and what he's saying is he wants to move so he can continue that process of changing into the person we're seeing him becoming. We'll let him move. Because there's a change taking place there. His testimony... What others saw of him was a value to him. I was like, okay, well, that was value to him. But what about to us? The value of a godly testimony. If we're saved, our sins are forgiven. Period. End of story. Forgiven. And yet, uh, some would look at that and say, well, if our sins are forgiven, we should just continue to live the same way we've always lived to show how great God's grace is. Now, some even take it a step further and say, because I'm a Christian, I can sin worse than I did before because God's grace is greater and I'm going to show that off. I, I see the wide eyes back there and I think that's good that you have wide eyes about that because that is not a biblical way of looking at sin and looking at, a, at the salvation that God has offered. At the same time, we would look and say, we, we show how great God's grace is because I was a sinner and I've been saved by grace. 
Peter is going to show us today how great a mistake it is to live that way, to say, I'm just going to sin because God's grace is greater. It's kind of like saying, uh, you go to a restaurant and someone says, hey, I want to let you know your dinner is paid for. Now, if they came to you as you were sitting down, you might say, someone just made a rookie mistake. I haven't ordered yet. A 44 ounce steak? I'll take two of those. And I want the baked potato and the French. I'm not going to eat it all. I'm going to take it home and eat it the rest of the week. Now, we would feel guilty doing that, wouldn't we? Because they've offered us something nice. It's often the case that if someone else is paying for something, I'll be more responsible with their money than I am with my own at times. Like, especially if we're going out to eat. When, when, when we go out to eat, like Jen and I went out for our anniversary, I want to go someplace nice and I want to enjoy stuff that I don't get at home or enjoy stuff that I don't want to take the time to cook at home. So we had a flatbread pizza and I had a hamburger that had stuff on it that I don't have at home and sweet potato fries that were better than the sweet potato fries we make at home, which that's hard to do. I know that. So, you know. And I want to enjoy it. And then the, the bill comes and I don't want to think about the bill and go, oh, I can't believe that I just spent that much for one meal. But if someone goes, hey, we're paying for this, all of a sudden I've got to do calculations in my head of how much they're thinking this is going to cost and I don't want to like overstay my welcome and all of that. God's grace doesn't mean a blank check for us to say, oh, well, just continue to sin. It's a blank check that it covers but more than showing God's grace by our sin in our lives, we're to show God's power by the conquering of sin in our lives. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Peter says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, as people that aren't from this world, that are, are strangers, that are pilgrims, you're just traveling here for a short while, to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Now, we're strangers and pilgrims in this world, but we're also strangers and pilgrims in these bodies. Our physical bodies are temporary. We hear people, oh, she's 101. Oh, this person's going on 110. Anyone heard of anyone hitting 200 recently? No. It, pretty limited. If you ask people life expectancy, uh, I'm not 100% sure what it is these days, but I think it's somewhere around 78, 79 in the U.S. Yeah, so how long is a life? 78, 79 years. That's a long time. For some of you, you think that's a long time. For some of us, we think, where did it go? Uh, I'm not to 79 yet, but at 52, I'm going, oh, wow, that's... How do they do midlife crisis at 50? Does everyone expect to live to 100? This isn't right. It's a short time. Short time compared to what? It's a short time compared to human history, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 10,000 years. Maybe 10,000 years. It's a short time in terms of eternity because God has always been and always will be. It's a short time. We are strangers and pilgrims in these bodies. Because we are strangers and pilgrims in these bodies, he says, abstain from fleshly lusts. Don't let what this body wants and the things that appeal to this body detract you from seeing what's truly important. You're here for a short time. It's kind of like if we were uh, training to be in the Olympics. I know the Olympics are over. It's good that it's over. I saw a, a, a statistic the other day that showed uh, medals by planet, and Earth took home all of the medals. Mercury, Venus, none. They, none whatsoever. That's a good thing, because I didn't see anyone else show up for the Olympics. But if we're training for the Olympics, and in that training, we're about six months in, six months left to go of, of our, our intense training for the Olympics. and. Uh, some of them, if you're saying you're only training for a year for the Olympics, it's probably a short time. Um, we're about six months in and our coaches go, you know what? I want to take you to have some fun. Now, just kind of cut loose a little bit. We'll go to Chuck E. Cheese, eat some really horrible pizza, and play some, some, some video games and skeet ball and all of that. And 
But the coaches say, but you cut loose a little bit, but remember, you're training. This is one day worth of fun. It's not worth throwing away your Olympic hopes. Well, that's what Peter's going to say. This life is a short time in eternity. Abstain from fleshly lusts. Verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. The first thing Peter's going to tell us is that our testimony can cause others to glorify God. The value of a godly testimony is that our testimony can cause others to glorify God. You say, well, what value is that to me? Well, Peter explains it. First, he says, abstain from fleshly lusts. Abstain from the fleshly desires that war against the spirit. The fleshly desires that drag down the spirit. Because in this world that we live in, there's a spirit realm and there's a physical realm. Now, to us, living in the physical realm, the physical realm is the one that seems most important to us in the flesh. We wake up. And we're hungry. Maybe you don't wake up hungry. I don't always wake up hungry. But when I walk through the kitchen and I see good food, I, 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 I get hungry. I walk by that box of peaches on the freezer and I think, ooh, those smell good. I'm going to have one of those. And we more often feel physical hunger than we feel spiritual hunger. And Peter's going to tell us, well, that's weird because your spiritual is the more important. The physical kind of detracts from that. This is where the monastic idea came from. And the monastic idea is kind of wrong, where the monks would beat themselves. So they would walk around on their knees to, to, to punish their bodies for existing, basically. Well, there's better ways to get the fleshly desires under control than to beat on yourself and and but at the same time Jesus says deny yourself abstain from fleshly lusts Galatians explains that if we go back to Galatians chapter 5 those fleshly lusts that war against the spirit what are we supposed to abstain from am I supposed to abstain from my sense of hunger I can choose to try to abstain from my sense of hunger but it, it kind of grows over time um, he's not talking about our hunger necessarily with the lusts of the flesh. But Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So Peter's talking about avoid, abstain from fleshly lusts. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, that you cannot do the things that you would. Hold on a second. My flesh and my spirit are at war with one another? Yes. Paul talks about it. Paul talks about it here in Galatians. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter. So wait, why would God make us flesh and spirit and make those things at war with one another? The answer is he didn't make us at war with one another. He made us so that flesh and spirit were together working towards a common goal of glorifying God. And when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they sinned and the flesh went to war with the spirit. That's not the way God created man. That's the way sin made man. So here, here it is, verse 18. But if you would be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which way are these? Now these are the works of the flesh. Not the lusts of the flesh. The lusts of the flesh lead to the works of the flesh. The works are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God." The flesh does not bring us closer to the kingdom of God. The lusts of the flesh bring us to the works of the flesh, which war against the spirit. Peter says, avoid, abstain from fleshly lusts. Paul goes on to explain that uh, verse 22, 
but the fruit of the Spirit. The works of the flesh are this, but the fruit of the Spirit. These are two things at war with one another. We can think about things at war with fruit and, and, and things that go against the fruit uh, because most of us around here are, are familiar with gardens or have a garden. And there are those plants that are producing fruit and there are weeds. If there are no weeds in your garden, please give us the, the trick. I know it, it's weeding your garden, but how to keep up with that. And the weeds are at war with the plants producing fruit. And when the plants produce fruit, here it is, the fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they which are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and lust. Abstain with, from fleshly lust because those lusts have been crucified. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Abstain from fleshly lusts. Abstain from those temptations to act in the flesh. What are the temptations to act in the flesh? Selfishness. I want what I want when I want it. When I don't get it, I'm going to act out. Or when I don't get what I want, I'm going to go seek it out. I am going to do what I want to do. Fleshly lusts. They fight against the spirit. Temptations to act in the flesh. But he tells us in verse 12, having your conversation honest. Oh, speak the truth. Conversation is your testimony, your lifestyle, how you live your life. And honest there, you could look at it, the reason they translated it honest, if you're living your life honestly, your actions match your words. There's an integrity to it. But the, 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 the root to that word, uh, honest, has to do more with virtuous. Having your lifestyle virtuous. The things we mentioned about fleshly lust, those are not virtues. No one says, ah, great virtue, murdering. Ah, it's virtuous to envy other people. But the fruit of the Spirit, those are virtuous. There's no laws against those things. Live honestly, virtuous conduct. Why? That the Gentiles the unbelievers, they, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, whereas they say that you in the church are doing wrong, they will have to look at what you're doing and say what you're doing is good, that they will behold your, your works, your good works, and glorify God in the day of visitation. When they see you, when the rubber meets the road, when they see you when difficulty strikes, when they see you when the temptation strikes, they will look and say, that's unnatural. That's not them. There's no way they could do that, and they will glorify God because they will see God's work. We have a perfect example of when that happened. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? That all those were reviling, were wagging their tongues at him and wagging their heads at him and saying, oh, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Hey, why don't you call and, 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 and come down off the cross and Oh, look, it's the king of the Jews. Ha, 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 ha. But what happened when Jesus died and he said, into thy spirit I commend my, uh, into your hands I commend my spirit. The centurion that was there looked up. The Roman guard over a hundred other Roman guards looked up and said, truly, this was the son of God. Truly, this was is not the way a natural man responds on the cross. This is not the way someone suffers and dies. They, he glorified God through what Christ did on the cross. He didn't give in to the fleshly lusts and he lived by the Spirit right up as he died on the cross. Live honestly, live with virtuous conduct. Make them go from speaking evil about you, about speaking evil about us, to having to say that God has done a work in our lives. Virtuous conduct does that. Now, this isn't a matter of, oh, well, I guess I need to work really hard and make sure that, that no one sees me do bad. No, this is a work of God in our hearts and in our lives. The flesh and the spirit fight against each other. Which one's going to win? The one you feed. 
The one you feed is going to win. The one you starve is going to lose. And if you abstain from fleshly lusts, you starve out those fleshly lusts, the fleshly side isn't going to win. If you feed it, it's going to get stronger and stronger and trip you up. If you feed the spirit, the spirit is going to win. They're at war. Who's going to win? We've got several places that are at war. Ukraine and Russia are at war. I, I saw this week, I know, I, I watch too much news. I'm going to work on that this week. But in the meantime, I saw this week that uh, an explanation because when I heard about Ukraine invading Russia, it was two days after it had happened. And I thought, wow, how did I miss that much news happening? I know my wife and I went out for our anniversary on Wednesday and we were kind of unplugged, but I couldn't have missed that big of a thing. The news media decided not to cover it, thinking that they would invade and they'd be repelled and it'd just be over before they could get news out about it. Like the news decided not to report it? Weird. But Ukraine went in and they stayed in and the news media had to report on it because now it's going on two weeks that Ukraine has held Russian territory. And they have to report on it. They looked and said, this won't last. Ukraine made them report on it. We need to make people see our good works and glorify our Father because it's not something we can do ourselves because we're going to feed the good side. Ukraine says, now we can invade because the Western powers have released us to use their weaponry in Russia. We had prohibited Ukraine from using American weapons in Russia so they hadn't gone across the border. Hmm. The U.S. is feeding the Ukraine military weaponry. Are they going to win? Well, it depends on how much we feed them. We've got Israel and Gaza. Which side's going to win? Well, I think Israel's ultimately going to win. I think God's got it behind that. Which side you feed is going to win. Virtuous conduct. He's going to go on to talk about virtuous conduct. Verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. What is virtuous conduct? Honoring our earthly authorities. Ah, good, I'll honor the king. I'm glad we don't live in a monarchy. Ha <laughs> ha! We don't have a king. Oh. Whether it be to king as supreme, whoever the supreme power is, supreme power in our land, we have a representative constitutional monarch. There's all sorts of words that describe our, our, uh, our, our government. We've got three different branches of government, the legislative, the judicial, and the executive. And those three have powers that balance off one another. When we're dealing with the supreme, if we had a king, the king is supreme. Who's supreme? Well, in our nation, the executive power, the judicial, or the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch all have aspects of being supreme. They all have power that's been granted to them by our government structure. So even though we don't live under monarchy, we have a lot more as supreme over us. And then they mention governors. And Peter's talking about all leaders. So what about when they go against God? Yeah, isn't it amazing how quickly we jump to that sometimes? How often do our governors, our presidents, tell us to do something that goes against God? It's, it's really just, it's a very small amount of time that that's actually going to happen. We have a lot of freedom to live out our faith the way we, and so Peter says, honor your earthly authorities. Verse 15, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Our virtuous conduct will 
will take away anyone's space to say something bad about us as believers. Peter says, do that type of virtuous conduct. Don't leave room for their accusations. So, well, we're not perfect. We're going to leave room for their accusations. But on our earthly authorities. Why? Because authorities are servants of God, whether they know it or not. Whether they know it or not. Well, what if they don't give us the answer we want? It's God that raises up rulers, so I know who better be president in November. No. It's God that raises up rulers. Who's president in November is beyond my pay grade. Choosing between the various people we have for president, I have the right to vote. I'm going to do my due diligence, and I'm going to select someone that I am comfortable voting for. But I don't have to worry about who becomes president because whoever it is, whether it's Kamala Harris, whether it's Donald Trump, I think RFK backed out. I, I don't know if he's still running. Whether it's Chase Oliver, uh, he's a, he's not constitutional. He's the, uh, yep, can't remember now. Or whether it's one of the others, whether the Democratic National Convention kicks off tomorrow with them going, you know what? I think we've done something horribly wrong here. We're getting rid of uh, uh, we're getting rid of Harris and uh, Tim, Tim, right? Tim, whatever his name is, Walls. We're getting rid of them. Let's start over. Whatever happens in the next couple of months, God is the one that raises up rulers. Who it be is is beyond my pay grade. What's within my pay grade is I need to submit to the governing authorities that God has given me. It's so much easier to rage against what's wrong with the options that we have. Authorities are servants of God. Even when we disagree with them, even when they're flat out wrong. Uh, uh, us parents like that when, when uh, children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Even when they're wrong, your responsibility is to obey them. So you do your responsibility and they're responsible to God. And as parents are, ha, see kids, you better obey. Ah, but we're still under government, even as parents. And God has given us the government we have and the rulers that we have, and we are to submit to them to every ordinance of man. Even in their earthly authorities, our authorities are servants of God. Our testimonies can cause others to glorify God. Does it glorify God when the church as a whole is railing against the authorities that God has given us? Yeah, you because know, people don't know much of the Bible. I, someone tell me this week that uh, women are supposed to hate snakes because the Bible says so. So I got to explain to them what happened in the garden and there was a curse and it was the seed of woman was going to crush the serpent's head and the serpent was going to bite the, 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 the woman's or the man's heel, mankind's heel, you know. And that's what's going on there. There's some distrust going on, but it's not that women hate snakes. That's a kind of boiled down. The snake probably could hate the woman too because, you know, they got into this conflict and the snake now slithers around on its belly. Interesting side question, did snakes, did snakes used to have legs? I don't know. Or did they used to kind of hop around like cartoon creatures? We don't know. Curse, they're slithering around. People don't know a whole lot that's in the Bible, but when they see us disrespecting authority, when they see us going crazy over, oh no, who's going to get in office? It doesn't look like we trust the God of the Bible who says he's in control and he raises up rulers. If he raises up rulers, he just doesn't raise up rulers that we like, obviously. And if our hope is in him, it better not be in a presidential candidate or a gubernatorial candidate or a Senate candidate or a congressional Senate, congressional Senate uh, candidate. It better be in him. So what do we do? We submit to our earthly rulers because none of us should ever say, not my president, not my governor, not my congressman, because that is rebellion against God. Peter says, submit yourselves to your earthly. Our testimony can cause others to glorify God. When they see us and we say, 
And they look and they say, well, you didn't vote for that person. Why are you speaking well of them? Why are you honoring them? Well, that's what my Bible tells me to do. Well, if, if my guy, the guy I hated got into office, I wouldn't be able to do that. Our testimony can cause others to glorify God. Our testimony shows which example we're following. Verse 16, uh, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. That's where people say, I'm free. My sins are forgiven, so I can do whatever I want. When I don't like something, I can punch someone in the nose. When I don't like something, I can take what I want for me. No, you're free, but don't use your freedom to serve yourself and to serve the fleshly lusts. When you serve the fleshly lusts, you feed the fleshly lusts, and guess which side's going to win? Use your freedom to serve God because the side you feed is going to win. Our freedom is not a freedom from our circumstances. Like, oh, I'm free in Christ. Nothing bad's going to happen to me. No, I'm free in Christ. I'm going to see persecution and tribulation. But I am free to serve God no matter what happens, no matter who is president, no matter who eats the last slice of cake, no matter who got the last donut, I don't know, whatever the case might, might upset us at some point. I'm free to serve God no matter what happens to me and what goes wrong. So use your liberty, not as a cloak for maliciousness, but as the servants of God. How does that play out? Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Wait a second. He says, honor God by honoring men and servants, not just with the good masters, but with the froward masters, honor your masters. Well, back up, submit yourselves under every ordinance of man, not just to the good rulers, but to the froward. Even to the lying politicians, you know, as rare as those are, submit yourselves to the lying politicians too. Honor God even when we are wronged with our response because we're free to respond that way. We don't have to follow the flesh that when we're wrong, we lashed out. When we're wrong, we have freedom to be able to serve God. Why? Because verse 19, for this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now, there are times working on a, on a vehicle that something breaks. It happens a lot. If I am using a tool improperly and not following the direction and something breaks, there's that, that brief moment of, and then there's that, I deserve that. <laughs> I wasn't doing it right. What did I expect would happen? Well, what good is it if you patiently endure when your own wrongdoing? When we've wronged someone you pulled out in front of someone in traffic and they honked the horn at you and you're like i'm sorry you're, you're careful with your gestures because you don't want to miss construing your gestures like i'm sorry i i didn't mean to i made a mistake please don't run me over what about when you're driving right when you're doing things right and someone attacks well that's where it takes godliness that's where it takes the spirit honor god even when we're the one that's wronged that's hard that one hurts verse 21 for he, even here unto were you called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps well all right i need to uh, honor men even when i'm wronged but how far do you want me to go with that here we give christ's example that was the example we were given. Who, verse 22, did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't find wrong in him. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself 
to him that judgeth righteously. He served God when he could have served himself. That's our example to follow. Serve God when you have the opportunity to serve yourself. That's the freedom we have in Christ. Our testimony shows whose example we're following, and our testimony can show that our debt has been paid. Verse 24, who his own self, Jesus Christ, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Our testimony can show that our debt has been paid. Or our testimony can show that our debt hasn't been paid. Jesus' service to God made his salvation available to us because we were as sheep going astray and we needed it. We were in the flesh. We needed it. Our testimony shows where we are. Are we dead to sin? Verse 23, and alive unto righteousness? Sorry, verse 24. Are we healed? By whose stripes you are healed? Is the sin nature conquered? Are we living in victory? Well, I still sin. Well, yes, but are we living in victory? Is the pattern of our life a pattern of failure or a pattern of victory where we see God at work in our life and we are growing closer and closer to the image of Christ day by day? Because we're feeding the Spirit and the Spirit is winning. If we're feeding the flesh, we're going to see more failure day after day. If we're feeding the Spirit, we're going to see more victory day after day. Which direction are we headed? Our testimony shows our debt has been paid. Are we still as sheep going astray or are we followers of the shepherd of our souls? If the debt has been paid, there will be a difference. Now that brings question. If, if there is no life, if there is no growth, if you're looking going, the flesh is winning and I'm trying, but the flesh keeps winning, you might look and say, well, there's no spiritual life there. What needs to happen is I need to get that spiritual life and that spiritual life comes from repentance accepting Christ as Savior and asking him to come and do a work in my life. If that's already been done, and you're like, but I'm not living in victory. Well, we need to start starving the flesh. Abstain from fleshly lusts. Starve it. Jesus says, if your hand offend you, cut it off. Really? Cut off my hand? Well, Jesus was not advocating for maiming ourselves, but taking sin seriously. Starve the flesh. Feed the spirit the value of a godly testimony because our testimony shows that our debt has been paid. If our testimony isn't showing that our debt has been paid, we either need to have our debt paid or we need to start using the tools that have been made available to us because our debt is paid. The value of a godly testimony is we can cause others to glorify God. Even if they don't accept God, even if they don't accept Christ as their Savior, they will have to glorify God because they will see in us a changed life that only God can bring. The value of a godly testimony, a godly testimony shows whose example we're following. Are we following Christ or are we following a political leader? Are we following a sports figure? Are we following a, a celebrity? Are we following ourselves? Are we following Christ? And our testimony shows that our debt has been paid. And if our testimony declares that our debt has been paid, it will show to others that their debt can be paid as well. We're going to close this morning with hymn number 400. I want to be like Jesus because we, we can have that as our desire to get there. What do we need to do? We need to feed the Spirit. Hymn number 400, I want to be like Jesus. Stand together. 400, I want to be like Jesus. Supreme desire that I may be like Jesus to this I fervently aspire that I may be. 
Thank and praise you in Jesus' name. 